Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're talking about glucose transport. So you're taking a big bite of some sort of carbohydrate, and that carbohydrate is made up of multiple sugars. These sugars, if we look at their basic form, what we call the monosaccharide, it's gonna be either glucose, fructose, or galactose. Now the thing is that fructose and galactose will turn into glucose, and it's glucose that we want that makes all this ATP, energy. So it means that when we get this sugar into our mouth, it needs to go from the mouth at some point into the bloodstream so it can be distributed around the body to all the different cells of the body. But it needs to also go from the bloodstream into those cells. So there's multiple different cells that glucose needs to move through to go from point A to point B to point C. So think about it like this. From the mouth into the small intestines, it needs to go through the cells of the small intestines to get into the blood for distribution. Then the bloodstream at the capillaries, the glucose will leak out and needs to go from the interstitium, which is the area just outside the cells, into the cells of the specific tissues for them to be used. So there's multiple different membranes that glucose needs to move through. This is so important because this is the rate limiting step for glucose metabolism. So you need to understand all these transport molecules. Now, predominantly at the tissues, the transport molecules are called gluts. And I'm gonna go through glut one to glut four, but there's around about 13 different glut molecules or transporters that you should be aware of. But before we do that, we need to talk about some other glucose transporters called SGLT1 and SGLT2. So think about it like this. You take a big bite of a cheeseburger, which has that delicious carbohydrate filled bun. You use the amylase, which is an enzyme in the saliva of your mouth to break down that complex carbohydrate into its simple sugars, let's just say the glucose. You then swallow, it goes down the esophagus into the stomach, from the stomach into the small intestines. Now we're here in the hollow inside of the small intestines. We call that the hollow lumen, the hollow inside. So it needs to go from the small intestines into the bloodstream for distribution. So it needs to move through cells that lie in the walls of the small intestines. These are called enterocytes. There's two membranes that glucose needs to move through. The membrane closest to the hollow inside and the membrane closest to the bloodstream. Now the membrane closest to the hollow inside is called the apical membrane and then the one closest to the blood is called the basolateral membrane. So the first membrane that the glucose needs to move through, the apical side, it uses SGLT transporters, okay? So I've zoomed in on this cell here and what you can see is in order to get glucose from the hollow lumen into the enterocyte cell, it uses sodium as a co-transporter. So glucose and sodium move at the same time. That's actually what SGLT stands for. It stands for sodium glucose linked transporter. Now if this is happening in the intestines, it's using the SGLT1 transporter. Now once the glucose is inside that cell, it needs to go from inside the cell into the blood and it moves through another transporter. This is a glut transporter. Specifically for the small intestines, it's glut 2, but I'll get to that. Now there's another hollow tube that glucose moves through and needs to go through two membranes as well to go back into the bloodstream. This is going to be that of the kidneys. So when again, you take that glucose into the bloodstream and it moves around, it's ultimately gonna to go to the kidneys and get filtered. Now glucose does get filtered into the kidneys, but the thing is you shouldn't be peeing out any of that glucose. That glucose should be reabsorbed back into the body, which means if we now imagine that this is the hollow tube of our kidneys, which we call a renal tubule, it also needs to move from the hollow inside to the blood and go through two membranes. The SGLT or SGL transporter in the kidneys is actually SGLT2, okay? And the glut transporter that it uses to go back into the bloodstream of the body is going to be that of glut three or glut two, depending on where we're referring to. Predominantly glut two if it's happening at the proximal convoluted tubule, but that may be too much for this video. Okay, so we've spoken about the SGLTs. Let's now talk about the gluts. So this is how we get glucose into specific tissues of the body. Now, there's four gluts you need to know and different tissues that these gluts are located to. How do you remember it? through my wonderful mnemonic. My mnemonic is big fat boys kill small little pansies producing nervous kids and mad fathers. So what do they stand for? Okay, the B, big here, this is standing for blood. So this is referring to red blood cells. So in order for red blood cells to pick up glucose, it needs a glut one transporter. The F here is for fetus. So as a developing fetus in your mother's womb, you only have GLUT1 transporters for glucose metabolism. Okay, the B here is blood 
glut-brain barrier. So in order for glucose to go from our bloodstream into our brain, it needs a glut-1 transporter. In actual fact, we need the blood-brain barrier, there's actually a blood-retinal barrier as well that also uses GLUT1. Okay, for GLUT2, KI in kill stands for kidneys. SM, or even the whole small, stands for small intestines. LI here stands for liver. And PA stands for pancreas. So all these tissues, in order to get glucose, it uses a glucose 2 transporter, and it's kidneys, small intestines, liver, and pancreas. Now the pancreas, you should probably be aware of, it needs to pick up glucose to release insulin, right? So at the beta cells of the pancreas is where we have GLUT2 transporters, and these are the glucose-sensing areas, okay? So glucose transporter three, We've got P here, so it's not going to be pancreas, it's going to be placenta. NE, neurons. And KI, kidneys again. Then down here for GLUT4, we've got M for muscles and F for fat. So here we're referring to adipose tissue. So again, for Muscles and fat to get glucose, we need GLUT4 transporters. Now, some more important points here is this. Glucose 1, does it need insulin? The answer is no. Glucose 2, does it need insulin? The answer is no. Glucose 3, does it need insulin? The answer is no. Glucose 4, yes. Glucose 4 is insulin dependent. So that means that when somebody has diabetes, which is a problem with producing insulin or that insulin binding to receptors, it's happening at GLUT4, which means it's a problem with muscles taking up glucose and fats taking up glucose. In actual fact, all these other different areas can take the glucose up without insulin, no problem. And the way that it takes all this, uh, take up glucose without any problem, the way that it takes it up is diffusion. So that means it goes down a concentration gradient, all of them. Diffusion, diffusion, diffusion. So it only goes from a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient of glucose. So it means it doesn't go against its concentration gradient. It doesn't need ATP. None of them use ATP to be able to take glucose in. These ones are facilitative diffusion. So they use a transporter but no energy going down a concentration gradient. And GLUT4 needs insulin to stimulate the transporter, GLUT4, to diffuse glucose in. In actual fact, for GLUT4, this transporter sits inside the cell. For all these others, it goes through across the entire membrane of the cell. So it can take glucose from the outside, throw it on the inside. GLUT4 isn't in the, it isn't in the membrane, it's inside the cell. And when insulin comes along, it triggers GLUT4 to move its way to the membrane to then pick up glucose. But another, so this is why when people don't produce insulin due to type 1 diabetes, for example, that no GLUT4 comes to the surface. So you have reduced numbers of GLUT4, and therefore the muscles can't take up the energy, you get very tired, you can't work, all right? So another important thing here, especially for diabetes, is exercise induces GLUT4 to move to the surface. So two things can actually bring GLUT4 receptors to the surface of your muscle cells and fat cells. One, insulin. Two, exercise. And this is one important reason why diabetics should exercise is because it stimulates the amount of GLUT4 receptors they have on the surface, increasing the amount of glucose they can get into the cells of their body so that they can function. Animal studies have shown that if you reduce the amount of GLUT4, not get rid of it, just reduce it, these animals, mice for example, become diabetics, okay? So exercise increases GLUT4 transportation or translocation to the surface to be able to bring more glucose into the muscles and the fat. Now, these receptors don't just take glucose in, they can take in other things. So for example, GLUT1 can take in mannose, galactose, and glucosamine. GLUT2 can take in fructose and glucosamine. And GLUT3 can take in mannose and galactose. So as you can see, 
These glut transporters don't just transport glucose, but they can transport a whole bunch of other types of sugars. All right, so this is a quick run through of glucose transportation.